many of us ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves? This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. What's up, guys? It's Boomer Anderson here, your host of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. The aim of this podcast is really to explore the vast world of health. We go all the way out to the fringes and back to the mainstream. We interview experts to separate true from false and deliver tidbits or bite-sized pieces of information which you can implement in your everyday life to improve performance. This podcast is brought to you by the ring on my finger. No, I'm not married yet, and I've avoided wearables for a very long time. I've tried a few. Actually, a few is an understatement, and most of them end up in the trash can. Why? Well, number one reason is accuracy. Number two is really usefulness. But when I heard about this next technology, I I must admit, I was initially a skeptic. I'm not exactly a ring guy, and well, wearables, I mentioned that earlier. But the Aura Ring is so much different. For one, it's a ring. It sits on any finger you choose, or for some of my friends, their toes. It's a super lightweight device that doesn't really get in the way of anything I do. The beauty of it is all of this data gets output into an easy-to-read mobile application where I can make choices on what I'm to do that day. Now, for me, how is this valuable in my own life? Well, I'm able to make and see directly the lifestyle and food decisions I make and how they impact items like deep sleep. Now, how accurate is this? Stanford Research Institute went in to buy a couple of Aura rings during Aura's initial Kickstarter campaign. I wish I would have followed them. They compared the Aura ring to a standard polysomography test, which is the gold standard of sleep measurement. And they found that Aura was able to determine sleep duration to an accuracy of 96% of the time and REM sleep to an accuracy of 61% of the time. Now, where do you get yours? You can go to AuraRing.com and order one of three different colors. You can get the oh-so-loud white, the mere black, which is what I have on my finger, and the manly, rugged and manly, matte black. If you plug in the code BOOMER, as in my name, B-O-O-M-E-R, you get 10% off, which is pretty cool given the price of the device. They'll send you a ring kit, you'll try on the ring, and you'll have your new device in your finger (laughs) shortly. Today, the topic is sleep. And my guest, he's pretty awesome. Dr. Benjamin Smarr, that's S-M-A-R-R, studies the temporal structures that biological systems make as they move through time. He is an NIH research fellow at the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Smarr's work focuses on understanding how physiological dynamics like sleep, circadian rhythms, and ovulatory cycles are shaped by the brain. He also studies how disturbances to those cycles give rise to disease. Dr. Smarr is also an advocate for scientific outreach. He routinely gives public lectures and visits K-12 classrooms to help promote the idea that by understanding our biology that guides us, we can live more empowered lives. This conversation is really a sleep 101. We get right into it, specifically why we sleep and why we need sleep. Do people actually survive on four hours of sleep? We get really into the stages of sleep, why people sleep poorly, and what we can do better starting tonight. This conversation was a lot of fun for me. If you want more information, they're in the show notes. It's decodingsuperhuman.com slash Dr. Smarr. That's S-M-A-R-R. And doctor spelled D-R. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Benjamin Smarr. Dr. Benjamin Smarr, welcome to the show. Thanks, Boomer. Before we get started, I, I just want to share a little bit about the story of how we met. And I just may embarrass myself a little bit here, but <laughs> I'm sure, or maybe you don't recall, uh, back at the Quantified Self Conference in Amsterdam, I, I was giving a talk about sleep genetics. And I have to admit, it was absolutely intimidating to walk into the room, introduce <laughs> myself to you, and find out that you study sleep professionally. <laughs> That's really funny. I thought you did a great job. I was really encouraged. That's why I wanted to then, you know, approach you afterwards and, and have these conversations. Uh, well, I look forward to all of the conversations we have in the future, and I hope to bump into you, you know, all the time at these conferences, because sleep is a favorite topic of mine, especially since I, I've left mm-hmm. the investment banking arena. But I think it's often really misunderstood. And also, I think people don't really understand uh, a lot about why yeah. they need sleep. And this is why I want to have this conversation today. 
So just for the audience, before we get started, what we're really going to do today is talk about the foundations of sleep. Think of this, if I go back to my, my college days, think of this as Sleep 101 with, uh, with Dr. Benjamin Smar. Uh, so Dr. Smar, are we okay to get into it? Let's do it. All right. Let's, let's start with a really basic question, one that I've always struggled to give a succinct answer to. Uh -huh. What is sleep? Well, it's a great question. And one of the reasons it's hard to give a succinct answer is that sleep is lots of things. But having said that, sleep is basically your body doing a maintenance cycle. So if you're going to be using your muscles, you're going to be using your guts, you're going to be using your brain. At some point, those things have to go offline so that your body can run maintenance on them. And so sleep is one way where all of that can happen in a consolidated fashion, which is to say all your different systems at the same time get back on track with each other clear out all the crap that you made using them during the day, you know, all the waste products, uh, and get them ready to be sharp the next day. Beautiful answer. I'm sure we'll get into some of these waste products in a little bit, or perhaps in further talks. So I think you touched on this a little in your answer of what is sleep, but why is it actually important to us? Well, of course, those two dovetail, right? So, I mean, it's sort of like saying, I know what a mechanic is, but why do I care about a mechanic? <laughs> if you know that a mechanic exists because cars break, then like, Okay, well, I guess it's important in case cars break. I mean, the, the difference here is carrying the mechanic analogy, I guess it would be sort of like going in for your tuned, uh, you know, your regular maintenance, right? You don't wait for the car to break. You go in and you change the oil. And if you don't, that's stupid. And if you're a competitive racer and you're like, I don't need to change oil. I just race all the time. Then you break your car and everybody is not surprised by that. And you look like a fool. So I think getting that mentality into how we think about our own bodies would actually be really good for everybody. What sleep matters for is refreshing your emotions so that you're uh, clear headed the next day, consolidating your memories so that you're learning, keeping your body fresh so that when you eat food, you actually get good nutrients out of it instead of, you know, maybe just spiking your insulin for a short while. Uh, it's, it's a fundamental thing for daily performance and it's a fundamental thing for healthy aging. Uh, and so one of the things I like to tell people is, you know, I don't take time off to sleep begrudgingly, I invest in sleep. I'm very happy to make time for good sleep. Okay, so you, you raise a very important point here is that just thinking of sleep as sort of actually an investment that has a return in that you'll be a better performer the next day because we know that your brain, and we know from recent research, actually not so recent research, that things like the glymphatic system clean out your brain, help you focus a lot more during the next day. So looking at it really as kind of an investment that you make with a high return in terms of your mental performance. Is that right? Absolutely right. And actually, I mean, the glymphatic stuff is still very new. We don't know much about that. Uh, that was just a few years ago that the first study was done. Uh, whereas, you know, thinking about healing from wounds or consolidating memories, I mean, there's whole libraries on that subject. So this, the glymphatics is very new. And what that is, it gets back to these waste products that you mentioned wanting more detail on. So, so we can just use that as an example. When your brain is active, which is of course all the time, it's generating waste products from burning fuel, just like anything does. And so when you're active during the day and you're, you're thinking really hard, you're focusing a lot, um, you know, you're, you're trying to do all these mental gymnastics to be super competitive at some intellectual job, that generates a huge amount of weight. And some of it is cleared out by your blood, but some of it just hangs around, right? It's sort of like a uh, haze in a city. If there's a lot of factories, you just accumulate haze. Um, and that's really bad because that gets in the way of clear signaling. And so the more of that there is, two things happen. One, the more that just adds noise to any signal that your brain is trying to send, uh, which of course means you're not doing as good a job. And two, it starts signaling to the neurons that they should want to shut down and sleep. So actually part of feeling tired is your neurons and your glia feeling those waste products, you know, sensing them and going, wow, we've generated a lot of waste. I guess we should probably shut down and do a maintenance cycle. Let's make the body feel tired so that we can do that. Uh, and so you, you can ignore it to a certain extent, but all that does is just let your city get hazier and hazier. And so then when you sleep, what you're letting happen is you shut down the factories, or at least you, you put them onto sort of a back burner mode and you let the wind come and clear out all that haze. Uh, and the way that can happen is a lot of the glia, which are these support cells, you know, they're, they're not neurons, they're not sending rapid electrical signals, so they're not as cool and they haven't gotten as famous, but they shape the neurons and they, they feed the neurons and they do all the support work. They will actually shrink down physically a little bit to get out of the way. And what that will do is increase the availability of flow. So it'll increase the flow through of uh, cerebrospinal fluid so that you can carry away all of this waste product more efficiently. 
And of course, what that means is they're not filling up the volume they normally would. They're not as close to all of the neurons and doing all the jobs they would normally do. So you can't really do that effectively while you're awake. You do it a little bit, but you do it much more when you let them take a downturn, you know, down cycle, uh, and then that lets you clear all this crap out of the air, as it were, and then you have a nice fresh, clean city that you can do stuff with uh, instead of people don't want to go outside and they have to wear masks. So, it, you know, it's the same in your brain. You can keep your neurons happy. You can keep them working fast by letting them do this clearance. Okay, Ben, I, I want to dive right into it. Can we talk a little bit about the different stages of sleep? You know, what are the differences between REM and deep and light, awake, etc.? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's, of course, the thing that most people know about sleep, right? As you go through these stages, Stages have different frequencies of brainwave associated with them. We know a lot about sleep stages, and yet that's become a little bit limiting in terms of how we actually learn about sleep as a whole body system, right? Because we have these ways of measuring brain waves, uh, EEG, then, you know, which is all the electrodes on your scalp that you see in movies when someone goes into a lab, whatever. That, or that, my house on a weekend. <laughs> yes, yeah, totally. Exactly, right? Like all of us hobbyist EEGs do. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you should be careful if you ever come over for dinner sometimes. Sometimes I try to talk guests into becoming subject. Um, I, I will gladly volunteer, actually. You don't need awesome. to talk me into it. <laughs> so, yeah. So what that has meant, though, is that a lot of the focus on sleep research has been only through that tool. And so when we think about how is it affecting hormones, and by it, I'm sorry, I mean sleep stages. How are sleep stages affecting hormones or body temperature regulation or or, for example, glymphatics, a lot of that is really unstudied uh, or very lightly studied. And so there's a lot of my research these days is actually stepping back from the EEG and saying, okay, we know about what the brain is doing. How is that coordinating other systems? And how are those systems feeding back and affecting the brain? Uh, so to get to your question now, <laughs> sorry, with a fair amount of No, you're, t you're touching on what I, I preach all the time, which is this whole concept of the systems approach to health and how everything interrelated it's it's thinking about your body as a system because you know, of course it is right your pieces don't get disconnected until you're dead and being dissected and that obviously is not when you're at your best performance so when you're asleep technically the way it's broken down into is uh, three stages of non-REM sleep or NREM and then REM sleep. And so uh, N1 is that first stage, and that's what I tend to refer to as uh, classroom sleep, right? So you're in a lecture hall. We all remember this. You're in a lecture hall. You sort of have a tripod with your you know, fists on your chin, and you're nodding off, and you, the buddy guy, the, the buddy next to you says, hey, hey, you know, you're, you're sleeping. And you go, no, I'm not. I can hear every word. But you're barely there, right? So that's sort of your brain is starting to disengage, but it's still really easy to bother you. So it's like freshman year in college for most people. Exactly. Especially if you had a, I mean, 8, 9, even 10 a.m. class, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Stage 2, N2, uh, that's then more classically sort of light sleep. And it's much harder to wake you up, but you're still rousable. And that goes into N3, which is then deep sleep. And so uh, deep sleep is traditionally thought of as the sort of physically most restorative sleep. It's correlated with higher levels of growth hormone being released, for example. And so that's what happens. You've worked out really hard or you've cleared land or whatever you've done. Your body is very tired and you just black out, right? You don't have lots of dreams. You just hit the mattress and you're dead. Uh, that's deep sleep. But after deep sleep, then you come sort of all the way down through and back up to REM sleep. And in REM sleep, the reason I say back up is your brain, your cortex, especially the surface of your brain, looks a lot like it does when you're awake during REM sleep. Um, so when you're in uh, either REM sleep or awake, there's just a lot of high frequency sort of cackling electronically going on in your brain. And that's because you, the cortex is being used. It's trying to process things. It's trying to make sense of things. When you're awake, it's whatever you're doing, right? So right now I'm thinking about Boomer. I'm thinking about podcasts. I'm thinking about making sure I talk about sleep right. And all of my brain is trying to coordinate on those activities. When I'm asleep, when I'm in REM sleep, there's no longer this external reality keeping them all on the same track. And so as a result, different parts of my cortex will start to rehearse whatever they thought was interesting or important most recently. Uh, and this is actually, it seems to be a lot of where dream imagery comes from, right? So I've got part of my brain thinking about, I nearly avoided a traffic accident. I've got part of my brain thinking about, I have to rewrite this paper. I've got half of my brain thinking about, wow, I can't wait to go and play with my chickens over the weekend. And so I start having weird dreams about almost getting run over by chickens that are trying to, you know, herd me into writing my paper. And it's all these parts of my brain trying, and, you know, one part of my brain is still trying to make sense out of all of these things. And so then I have these weird dreams. So REM is sometimes called paradoxic sleep because it looks a lot like wake, even though you have to have gone through the deepest layers of sleep normally to get there. The other, the other stages, the non-REM sleep, 
those are usually called slow wave sleep. Uh, and the reason for that is instead of this high frequency cackle of real activity, all the neurons in a given area will start to get coordinated. And so if you monitor the entire head, you'll see these waves of electrical potential propagating across the brain, and it's very ordered and it's very regular. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's where a lot of the restorative, physically restorative work is happening. So you've been active, every part of your brain thinks it was doing something important. You've got to sort of get them all on the same channel and bring them all down to baseline again before you can start doing your REM sleep rehearsals. Uh, because basically what happens is you you don't want your skull to explode, right? You, you want to grow synapses that are being useful, but if you grow all of them every night, you just run out of brain space. And so you have these nice slow waves that are helping to, you know, basically get all of the neurons on the same channel about, okay, well, what was really important today? Let's get rid of all of the petty stuff. Let's all calm down a little bit. And then let's take stock and say, okay, now that we've, now that we've chilled out, what do we still think is really important? Let's focus on that. In this stage, this is really the memory consolidation. And if I was a bodybuilder, this is where my muscles repair itself. Is, do I have that right? Well, it's the relationship that's really important. So this is a, this is a sticking point, and it's, it's a tricky thing. Uh, you'll often read, you know, deep sleep is when you heal, or REM sleep is when your memories are consolidated. Uh, and it's really not the case. If you don't get any REM sleep or you don't get any deep sleep, you know, even if you get eight hours, it's not going to be nearly as restorative in either case. What you need is those cycles. What you need is to... to sort of prepare the land and then focus on what's important a little bit, let things grow, and then repeat the cycle. Trim that down and then pull up the parts that are still really important and then trim that down and then pull up the parts that are really important. And that's a refining process. And if you don't have those cycles, then you aren't going to be either as healthy or as good uh, mentally refreshed as, as getting as good memory. Uh, and so that's one of the things that's really difficult to get people to see is it's not just how many hours did you sleep. It's not just, you know, look at my REM score from my aura ring, it's were you getting good stable cycles? Uh, and those cycles, of course, they're a little harder to track. So it's a little less sexy already in the market. But as the trackers get better and better, I think it'll be easier for people to start to see that. And hopefully that'll catch on. Okay, so I think you just touched on it quite a bit. And I think we can almost go through this question. But uh, so constituting good sleep is really about having that cycle follow each other and progress up and up. Is that Absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Good sleep is enough sleep but that is very different person to person. Some people really can get away with a few hours, and we'll probably talk about that more a little bit later, but most people, it's somewhere between, call it, you know, seven and nine hours. But the really important thing is whatever the amount that you get, the stability of that sleep is what's really important. That you go to sleep roughly the same time, that you let yourself go through these cycles to completion. You know, one of the great evils of the modern world is the alarm clock, because it wakes you up when you would have been completing this last long bout of REM. And so it, it cuts you off mid-cycle, uh, and that's very disruptive. If you could, and there are companies that have tried this, if you could wake somebody up at the right moment of transitioning cycles, you know, then it would, it would probably be a lot less disruptive. I think we're going to get into some of those tools of good sleep later. Okay, Ben, do you mind just breaking it down for us? What is a circadian rhythm and <laughs> why is this important to people? I know, right? Circadian rhythms suffer from a branding problem. Sleep, you can put that on a poster, you can write that on a shoe, like sleep is super easy for everybody to see, to hear. Circadian rhythm sounds so technical. It sounds technical, and a couple of years ago, if you would have brought it up, it seemed very woo. Now it's to at least, uh, it seems to at least come back center stage, thanks to a lot of work that you and a number of others are doing. But I think just kind of summarizing why it's important, what exactly it is, is something that people need to understand. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. It's great that we had the Nobel Prize being given to people in circadian biology because it, it, my life has all of a sudden gotten a lot easier. You know, normally people go, what do you do? Oh, I'm a circadian biologist. What the hell is that? Um, so, and that's, that's actually part of why I got into sleep was it was just so much easier to talk to people about sleep. But sleep uh, actually depends on circadian rhythms. So what circadian, we can break it down, right? Circa is about dia is day. So it just means it's it's biology about a day. And what that comes from is we all evolved on Earth since we were little single cellular organisms. And obviously, if you can see something coming and get ready for it, you can deal with it a lot more efficiently than if you just react to it, right? I mean, that's why we do our homework. Evolution said, well, gee, there's this really regular pattern of where it gets really hot, really bright, you know, really good for photosynthesis, really bad for sunburns. Why don't we just anticipate that and get ahead of it every day instead of being surprised when all of a sudden we're too hot now? And so circadian rhythms are just biology's response to the fact that the day exists and is regular. 
and it's biology's way of saying, you know, rather than waiting for it to be really bright out to wake you up, let's just plan on waking up when we know it's going to start to get bright out and, and get ahead of the day. Or similarly, what you see a lot in the wild is animals trying to avoid each other. So if I know a lion is going to be out between dawn and dusk, maybe I want to wait until, to get up until after dusk and then there aren't so many lions out and about. What's, what's really interesting about sleep cycles and circadian rhythms is that the slow wave sleep, right, the deep sleep, the healing sleep, uh, as we were talking about it, that's mostly something that these waste products are signaling. So your body is listening to how used has it been, and when it gets to a certain level of tiredness, of usedness, it goes, okay, well, look, we should sleep. The REM sleep is actually driven by your circadian rhythms. It's not driven by how used up your body is. So these two drivers are separate from each other. And yet, they have to line up to allow you to have nice sleep cycles. And this is one of the major challenges in the modern world, is that, uh, which I think is really sort of fascinating. Right? In, the his, in the history of life, there was no reason they wouldn't line up. You'd get up, you'd go be active for a while. By the time you're tired, that's about the same time every day. And so you can anticipate with a timer when should REM sleep start. Because we now stay up to watch Netflix or work extra late or get up with an alarm clock or whatever it would be, do jet lag, the amount of physical tiredness we have no longer is the same day to day. And so it becomes very difficult to line up the REM sleep with that tiredness sleep. Uh, and so we end up having much less good quality sleep because we have these really unstable sort of what we call circadian disrupted rhythms. Uh, and that's, again, why I would say anybody who's really interested in optimizing sleep, the most important thing is routine. Letting your body know when am I going to be sleeping every day so that those cycles can line up. Okay, let, let's get it. Now that we've established what the circadian rhythm is, what's what's the dangers of breaking the circadian rhythm? And I guess kind of part B of that, the dangers of sleep deprivation. So, and maybe maybe that's two questions if you want to handle it that way. You know, when I was a young, aspiring investment banker, there were times where I would go through weeks getting four to six hours of sleep, probably did that for a few years. And so what would be the some of the dangers that a person faces if they're one of these hard driving people and just forcing themselves not to sleep? Um, I mean, we've all done that, right? And I'll start with a hopeful message, which is that the longer you don't do that after having done it, the more your body is able to heal. So, so you haven't necessarily permanently damaged yourself, but we all do. That. That, that's refreshing, by the way, as somebody who did this <laughs> for years. So, so what you're saying is it's almost like if you quit cigarettes after a while that those toxins clear out of your body. Is that the same for sleep? It's similar. So um, maybe I'm just off base there. No, no, no. It, it's similar. I mean, cigarettes is actually a really interesting example because it, it's very difficult to clear out a lot of that because what happens is you, you accumulate toxins and those you can clear, but you also do a certain amount of scarring and the scarring doesn't ever really clear up. And that's why even if you smoked as a young man uh, and stopped for decades, you still are at higher risk for lung cancer, for example. But you're much better off having stopped because you've also now cleared out those toxins and you've stopped accumulating more scar tissue, right? So your, your body has a lot of plasticity, a lot of resilience uh, if you let it. Then sleep deprivation is very much like that. You, by, by disrupting your circadian rhythms or by not getting enough sleep or by not getting good quality sleep, which comes from disrupting your circadian rhythms usually, what you're just doing is you're not letting the refresh cycles happen. and then when you're awake, you're also not letting all the different parts of your body line up together. So if you imagine, you know, being in a loincloth with a spear on the savanna, you get up the same time every day, you go to sleep when the sun goes down because it's dark, what are you going to do? And that happens to every organ in your body, right? Your liver, your pancreas, your guts your muscles, to say nothing of your brain. So basically all of these individual organs have their own rhythms, right? Exactly, exactly, right? So if you were the uh, little cell way before having an organism was fashionable, right? Uh, life was single cellular for several billion years before multicellular life arose, mm -hmm. uh, most of history. And circadian rhythms were part of that history. So we're built out of cells, each of which has their own circadian rhythm. And so we are a co we're a networking problem. We're a coordination problem. We need all the little cells in our body to agree and to line up. And then when my liver is trying to process toxins, you know, that should follow a meal, not precede a meal. When my pancreas is going to release insulin, that should follow a meal, not precede a meal, not be in the middle of the night. But they don't all hear each other distinctly. 
they, they're coupled, but they're not strongly coupled, which means that if you fly to France, it takes you a few days for all the organs to line back up on France time. Uh, that's why jet lag sucks, is because you have this internal, you know, everybody is not sure what time it is, so things are not lining up the way they're supposed to. People show up for meetings when the meeting doesn't start for half an hour, and it's inefficient, right? I understood. Now, can, just because you brought up jet lag, I have to ask this question, uh, because I was the type of person who flew hundreds of thousands of miles a year for a long time. Do you know how many times I, moon and back you've been? I, I I haven't done the calculation yet, but uh, many. <laughs> I actually, I will probably do it after we get off of this. But I want to. Um, I have to ask the question: If you go, let's say you're switching time zones twice a week, and do your organs ever get really a chance to line up? I, I mean, this seems dangerous long term. Exactly right. Exactly right. The they really don't is the short answer. I mean, there's there's you know maybe if you go from. Indiana to New York City and back, that, that's less than going from New York to China and back, right? But they really don't. Basically, what you're doing is you're just letting all of your organs run at whatever time they're able to, and you're never giving them time to catch up and realign. And so, you know, your insulin is not being regulated as well, and your risk for obesity goes up, which is exactly what we see. Uh, your cell refresh is not happening at the right times, and your risk for cancer goes up, and that's exactly what we see. Uh, arthritis, heart disease, depression, early onset of dementia, I mean, just, you know, infertility, anything you want to name, because it's happening in your body and your body is a network, when that network is disturbed, I might not be able to tell you exactly which node in the network is going to go strong wrong first, but I can definitely tell you that you're at risk of breaking your network much more than somebody who's letting it line up nicely. This is, this is fascinating to me because there used to be times where, you know, I would get off the flight from London to Singapore and for, uh, which I've done multiple, multiple times and your brain just, you'd feel like half a person. Exactly. And this is just because all of my rhythms were frankly broken. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we've never had the ability to do that to ourselves before. So this is kind of a new thing. And I think that's part of why circadian rhythms haven't quite cracked popular awareness is we've only been breaking them recently in the last few decades. And so it's there's still a lot of catching up to do. Everybody's always slept, but there's never been an issue of rapidly destroying your alignment to the day. And so we're still just helping people get online with this intuition of, okay, well, there's an external day, but there's also all of these internal days. And intuitively, they should line up, but we're not letting them. I, I love this. All right. Can we, can we delve into the genetics real quick? Sure, yeah. um, on it, Because it's so recent with the Nobel Prize and everything, let's talk about period and clock genes. Awesome. Do you, do you mind just touching on how those play a role in our circadian rhythms? And how each individual may have different circadian rhythm? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and let me start by saying, you know, the, the Nobel Prize was in flies, but a lot of the genes, because they're so ancient, right, because they go back to when we were all just one cell, um, a lot of the clock genes are conserved across all of evolution. And so the flies gave us a huge insight into the way that mammals work and then the way that humans work. And in fact, the very first gene that proved that genetics can affect behavior was period. And that was the work that preceded this Nobel Prize. And the behavior was it changed the circadian rhythm if you had a mutation in your period gene. Uh, and that was, I mean, that was a big deal that it really confirmed, yeah, your genes actually affect who you are and not just, you know, how you're built. So the way the genes work, you can think of it as a sort of a, a feedback system. So usually there's what we call positive genes, and those would include clock, or BMAL, uh, clock is obviously going to be the one that is easier to remember, and a whole family of them. And those are activators. And so they will activate things like period. And period, of, there's also a family. There's period one, period two, period three. Uh, and there's a bunch of other genes that these positive things activate. But then they activate what we call the negative actors, the negative factors. And those negative guys repress things. And so what you get is a feedback cycle where because proteins are always being broken down, none of them will stay around forever. So you make some positive guys, those make some negative guys, the negative guys repress the positive guys, so now you have less positive guys. But after a while, you don't have any positive guys, so there's nothing making the negative guys. So now the negative guys get broken down, and the positive guys stop being repressed. So now you're making positive guys. But that means you're making more negative guys. So it goes negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. And when that wheel takes 24 hours, that's a circadian clock. There's other instances of feedback like that that happen at different time scales. And, you know, within a day, you have a bunch of these things happening. But there's a whole set which are specifically trying to match that 24-hour rhythm. And so those are what we call your clock genes. And they're in these feedback cycles of somebody not letting somebody else go until they've been broken down. And then that sort of releases the pressure and the next piece can go. And then that releases the pressure for the next piece. And it, it's a, you know, it's like a Rube Goldberg flywheel kind of thing. So it, when you're talking about bad guys, are, there, are these things like adenosine and uh, that build out 
build up throughout the day, or is it something else? Yeah, when we're talking about the waste products, exactly. Adenosine is a great example. Um, and there's, I mean, there's a million sort of small molecules that are the results of having broken down larger things or the results of metabolism. Um, but yeah, adenosine is a, a classic example. And adenosine is definitely one of these things that's well studied that your neurons are listening to and going, oh, wow, there's a lot of adenosine around. I guess it's probably time for us to think about going to sleep. And in fact, one of the ways that coffee works is it blocks those receptors for adenosine. And so then you feel awake because you're, you're removing that sleep pressure. I mean, it, it does a number of other things too, but that, that's one tie-in. So absolutely. Okay. Now with, with genetics, is it possible that people have, uh, let's say, for instance, my girlfriend is a, a, you know, I think the night owl is a common term used. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is it possible that you have, you know, people that genetically code to be night owls, whereas, you know, a person like me who wakes up way early. <laughs> Honey, it's not my fault. It's my <laughs> clock genes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it can make that excuse that it is my genetics that caused me to wake up. Now, is that is that the case? <laughs> yeah, it seems to be. I mean, there's this is something that we're still studying, and there's a lot of uh, variability person to person. But generally speaking, you know, we've described this genetic flywheel. You can imagine if you had a mutation that made one of these genetic pieces stickier or less sticky, that would change the speed of the wheel, right? And so these mutations in the clock genes, it really does then correlate with uh, how early or how late a person you are. So we tend to say, and this is, you know, this is sort of off the cuff stuff. It's not precise terminology, but we tend to say people are larkish or people are owlish, right? So a morning lark gets up really early. Mm -hmm. An owl stays up really late. And if your clock genes cycle slightly faster than 24 hours on average, that will make you an early person. You'll get up early, but you'll also want to go to bed early. And if your genes cycle slightly longer than 24 hours, which is actually most of the population, then you'll start your day a little bit later and you'll want it to run a little bit longer. So you'll go to bed later. And that changes across your life. So when you hit puberty, uh, you know, sex hormones come up and those tend to make everybody want to get up later and stay up later. When you get older, then those tend to come down and you tend to want to get up earlier and stay up earlier or uh, wake up earlier and go to bed earlier. But uh, generally speaking, you have what we call a chronotype, which is, again, sort of how owlish or larkish are you? Uh, and I'm definitely on the larkish side. It sounds like you are. It sounds like your girlfriend is an owl. And I mean, that, that's totally fine. Like You just explained a lot of relationship issues for me. For, for so many of us, for so many of us. It's, it's another one of those things where when you can say, baby, look, circadian rhythms, it's a thing. You know, it, it externalizes the conflict. It's not about a choice that's malicious that you want to go to bed at a time when you can't snuggle or something. Like, it's, it's just your biology, right? Uh, you know, it's like if somebody is is from South Africa and they don't have the genes to digest milk, you, there's no point getting mad about it. Like that's biology. So it's the same thing. You just say, okay, well, look, I'm I'm an early person, you're a late person. Like, let's just try not to wake each other up when we get in and out of bed. After this, I'm going to have you call her and explain it because, <laughs> yeah, you, you can explain exactly why I need to go to bed at, you know, 10, 10 p.m. every night. You that, She's though, exactly. <laughs> she's out cranking out work, in which we're going to get into sleep habits in a second, but she's out cranking out work until yep. midnight. Um, but okay, I love diving into genetics and sleep and all of these kind of things and how we're just so individually different. Yeah, I love that. That's it, man. It's And this is actually why sleep is so hard is we're all so different that there's some conserved things, right? So, I mean, you can learn from fruit flies about some of the genetics. That's very conserved, but we all are different. And this idea that, well, everybody has to have eight hours. Everybody has to go to bed at 10 p.m. Like there's nothing in reality that is good for everybody. So we need to get away from that. And the problem is science generally works by taking average. So this has been a lot of my career is trying to find new ways of doing the science where, where what I call it is embracing the heterogeneity or celebrating the diversity, right? Is how do we look within individuals for patterns that then abstract across people rather than just glomming everyone together into one big blurry average that isn't very informative. Exactly why I dove into the health field is because I everybody's individual and yeah. it's just from sleep to exercise, everybody responds differently to different things. And if once you find that way to do science on individuals and <laughs> that, uh, I, I'm right alongside with you uh, linking arms there. Now let's, let's go a little bit into what people do poorly when it comes to sleep in terms of just what are some bad habits that people have that they may be able to change even tonight uh, to get better sleep? Yeah, well, sleep very much is a habit. I mean, you can you can sort of get your clocks, your circadian clocks used to the time at which things should happen. Uh, and so you can have sleep habits that make it a lot easier to both go to sleep and stay asleep. One of the things that has gotten a lot of coverage recently is blue light. 
Uh, and so that's, that's a real thing. You have cells in the back of your retina, actually the front of your retina, but it's the lowest level of your retina, these ganglion cells that are blue sensitive, and they're trying to tell when is it the day. They go directly to your central clock in your brain. And if you shine you know, the windows background at them until midnight, they're just sitting there going, I don't know, I can still see the noontime sky. It's bright blue out. I guess it's the daytime. And so they're screwing with your clock. Now, the problem is they're also getting information from all the rest of your eyeballs. So just blocking the blue light isn't as good as actually being in the dark, but it is a little bit better. Um, so these apps that, you know, make your phone turn yellowish as it gets later, they're not a miracle cure, but they actually are better than nothing. So if I'm cranking away on my computer late at night, you're saying that one of these like F dot Lux or I, my favorites Iris are, are better than nothing? They're better than nothing. They're, they're not magical. They're not going to make everything work just fine, but they are better than nothing. And if, another thing you can do is turn your screen brightness down as much as possible. Um, and one of the things that I think is really neat is as far as we can tell, firelight doesn't really have a big phase shifting effect on your clock. Uh, and so, which, which is, is not well studied, but which there's evidence for that's fairly convincing to my eye. Um, so if you can make it look sort of like a red light, you know, like you're in a developing studio or something, that probably is way less impactful than dim blue light would be. Okay. What about all these funky orange glasses that you see people wearing, particularly health conferences. Well, and I'm guilty of this. If you, you can probably find pictures of me online wearing these funky orange glasses at the previous fire conference. Um, from my... Well, if you, uh, if you can see into my office right now, they're not too far away from me. But <laughs> um, it's the same thing. I mean, they're, to my mind, the importance of blue blockers is making people aware of the problem mm -hmm. much more than it is actually creating a solution. On the other hand, like I said, you know, the people that I've looked up to for years in this are the Harvard Sleep Group, and they've done a lot of convincing research that these blue blockers really do more than nothing. They, they really do help somewhat. Uh, but the best thing to do is imagine yourself being a caveman, right? If you get good sleep, you'll wake up full of energy, a sharp mind, ready to go, club and elk or whatever you're going to do. You know, you can you can go do that super well, come back, and your evening should be sort of a ritual. It should be a wind down. And you're getting, like you said, you're building habits. And so you, you wind down. You're like, okay, it's the evening. I'm putting away the work. You know, I'm going to snuggle with my person. I'm going to think about getting ready for bed. I'm going to use my, you know, red setting on iris when I'm checking the news. You know, and that's another thing. There's So there's input to your eyes, but there's also just excitement. Yeah, that's true, right? Reading the news late at night, especially... And some of the headlines, right? Exactly. I can tell you what the headlines are going to be for the next 50 evenings. Trump did something stupid. The world <laughs> Right? You don't need to read it now. I just saved you the time. So if you get yourself worried about things and excited right before you're trying to relax and go to sleep, you know, it doesn't take somebody who's a neuroscientist to tell you maybe that doesn't make the most sense. Um, if you can do, like I say, something that's winding down, this is why reading is something that everybody does before bed, right? It's sort of calming. You read something that's not a gripping spy novel, but just interesting. And it really helps you sort of wind down. And at some point it gets a little bit dark to read and that is sort of a signal, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm guilty of reading anything from like comic books to, well, comic books may be a little bit gripping sometimes to uh, just sort of run-of-the-mill philosophy before bed just so I can fall asleep a little bit easier. But yeah, I love reading right before bed. Yep, no, that's great. I, I actually just finished, I'm not actually a huge comic book reader, but I just finished the Sandman Chronicles because uh, I'm a, becoming a Gaiman fan. Yeah, Neil Gaiman's a great guy. I love, um, is it the Graveyard Book? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a great book. Of yeah, he's a very good writer. And I, it was it was ironic thinking about what you're saying because I would want to stay up, you know, the, the main character, for those who don't know, uh, is the personification of sleep. And he's one of these sort of great power in the world that he goes on adventures being sleep and the irony was of course that i would i would be interested and in stay up reading about sleep instead of getting good sleep so that's a little silly <laughs> sounds like this comic was crafted just for you uh, right right no it was when i discovered it i was like wait what <laughs> <laughs> So we touch a few things about what people can do better to sleep. Uh, things like establishing a sleep routine, not reading news late at night, these blue light blockers, et cetera. What about some of these quantified self devices? I, I mean, you and I met at the quantified self conference uh, and we've had long conversations about good ones, bad ones, and ones I've bought before that have since gone bankrupt. Um, hey, me too. I used to wear a Zio every night and get my little thing <laughs> out of that, and then they disappeared. In terms of these quantified self devices, are any of them useful? Um, any ones that you particularly like or have a future? Yeah, I mean, how, who has a future is extremely hard to tell, right? I mean, that that's yeah, that's you true. know that professionally, but 
um, I think they are really useful. I mean, I, I talk to a lot of these companies and I can't say one of them is going to transform the world in a way, you know, more than any other or even still be alive in a year from now. But it's a great partner to have these companies when we're trying to reinvent personalized science because only by having the patterns that are the boomer sleep patterns across time will I be able to, as a scientist or a clinician, look at those data and say, oh, hey, wow, there's this thing that's really changing, right? So a, a nice analogy I like to use is temperature. If you go to the doctor now for your whatever it is, once every 12 months or six months, if you're really diligent to check up. You know, in the Netherlands, people almost never go to the doctor, but that's an, I, another I try never to go to the doctor myself, right? So, so the doctor takes my temperature, let's call it once a year, right? And they look at the number and they go, oh, you know, 98.9. Yeah, that's within the range that humans have. That's the most information you can get from that. Whereas, for example, your sleep cycles change your temperature. If I can see over time, right? Then I can say, well, it's 98.9 and, and maybe that's basically normal, but it's happening right in the middle of this period of sleep where you should be at your coldest. So something is definitely wrong, right? And, and you can't get that from a single measure and you can't get it from a population average. You can only get it by saying in the context of this person's dynamics, do these things look right or not? And so, you know, for example, have I noticed that your sleep cycles are becoming chaotic instead of nicely ordered? That warns me if you're getting older, and I mean, this doesn't apply to you for a few decades, but people getting older, that warns me that maybe they're at risk for dementia and we should start doing a treatment sooner. If it's happening to you, maybe I'd say, gee, maybe we should talk about your sleep habits. You know, do you have ap apnea? Um, have you been drinking too much right before you go to bed and then you're not getting able to breathe well? Like you can start to intervene. Whereas if all I say is you got, you know, 30 minutes of REM and you got six hours of sleep, like that doesn't really tell me anything because compared to what, how do I know whether that's good for you or not? And so these tracking devices, they're experiments. They're trying to say, well, like, do we care about heart rate? Do we care about heart rate variability? Do we care about activity? Do we care about your social apps? What can we learn from your Facebook activity? Like all of this stuff, we, we don't know what the best answer is and there will be different best answers for different people. So, you know, my parents probably don't give a lot of Facebook activity and you couldn't track them as well as my students because that generational divide changes how we interact with the world. On the other hand, you know, heart rate is something everybody has. Uh, breathing rate is something everybody has. Temperature is something everybody has. So what are the patterns? How do we help people be aware of those patterns and, and take care of themselves until the science catches up to have really good personal advice? Um, but you hear a lot these days about personalized medicine or personalized predictive wellness. All of that can only happen if people have personal data trails to compare to. So while I think in the very long run, these wearable devices are sort of a transitional phase, for the time being, that's the only thing we have going to learn what are these patterns. So they're, they're actually really important to the progression of medicine, I think. I, I completely agree with you. And I, I just, you know, in my own life, I use them. And I think where people go wrong is they they buy a device and they expect it to do the work for them. And right. I, I'm of the opinion that if I can get a device that'll get me paying attention to a particular habit I have and give me data on the effect of that habit, and I'll give an example here in a second, that is very, very useful. And the example I always give is if I eat particularly too close to bed, well, obviously your, your, your metabolism is active well into your sleep and then therefore my lowest resting heart rate gets pushed back later in the night and i don't feel as great in the morning and that's just a simple experiment so what do i do i just kind of bump my my sort of final eating eating time can't speak today uh my final eating time back earlier in in the night and it yeah. helps my sleep and my recovery so much better that's a great example and i mean i think this is gonna be how doctors keep their jobs in the future because like right now an ai can do radiology scans faster faster and at least as accurately as a given radiologist. So being just technically knowledgeable is not what's going to keep humans useful in the workforce. It's having these relationships. It's saying, here's my data. That's helping me to be aware. Who's somebody that knows about this kind of awareness or that knows about what I carry? I'm eating or sleeping or whatever it is. That can help me interpret my data. That can help me make better decisions that can sort of be a coach and a buddy. Um, so, I, you know, I have this vision of the future where clinicians and scientists and interested citizens have a much more interactive ecosystem. And my science is driven by you and me generating data with other people that share our interests and saying, well, what are the patterns? How do we quantify that? How do we build, you know, algorithms that can detect that early? Working with clinicians that are interested in that area of care saying, oh, well, if that's what you care about, here's things that we would do. Here's interventions, you know, and then, the, and then you coming back and being like, yeah, this worked, this didn't work. I don't understand this piece. That's a virtuous cycle. Uh, it just takes breaking down the silos in a way that are not, you know, the motivations within 
in society right now don't support that. Um, so that goes hand in hand with building the science is, is building the motivations so that people are rewarded for stepping out of their silos that way. But I think I think that's exactly the way to do it. It's not that the device is going to solve your problem any more than you're going to take a pill and stay up all night eating cupcakes and be healthy. It, it's having a relationship and being mindful of yourself and knowing that data can help that mindfulness. That may be a good point to actually close out this session because I know uh, we're going to, I want to have you back on because I know you and I can talk for hours about this stuff. Uh, yeah, no, this is very fun. I, I would love to do that. And now where, if people want to find more about your work, Dr. Benjamin Smar, where would they, where would they find you? It's a good question. Um, one of the things I have to learn since I'm really just sort of deep in my science most of the time is how to do the like public engagement thing because they don't train you how to do that you know i'm i'm a nerd basically right so i'm learning <laughs> how to i'm learning how to have a public face um i would love to engage anybody interested about this um if you google me you'll find me quickly i'm at uc berkeley um you can find me on facebook benjamin smar and i usually mostly what i post on facebook is just if i've written like i recently did a blog series for the aura ring um you can google that or you can find it on my facebook posts i try to just post science related things or whenever put out papers. Uh, and of course, you can find uh, most of my publications on PubMed, which is a database that the NIH maintains for scientific so biomedical publications. So some of the engineering stuff isn't on there, um, but most of the biology stuff is on there. But there's always ongoing projects that are not published yet, right? Publishing is always the, it's the release. It's not what are you doing now. Um, so publishing always lags. And I, I think maybe people don't know this. Publishing usually lags like close to a year behind the project. And so you can see what I've published, but, you know, find me and, and reach out and we can talk about ongoing projects. We can build these collaborations. That's that's what actually really excites me these days. Well, I'll put all of this information in the show notes so that people will be able to get a hold of you quite quickly. Sounds great. But Ben, thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, it was such a fun and, you know, intelligent conversation. And I really feel like people are going to learn a lot and I learned a lot. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, it's a real pleasure, Boo Boo. Thanks for reaching out. Um, it's nice to get the feedback. I never know whether I drift off into weird nerd space or whether I'm sounding intelligible. So that's, it's nice for me here too. No, it, it was extremely helpful. So thank you again. All right. Well, I'll see you next time then. All right. Take care, Ben. Bye-bye. Just one more quick thing before we go. If you really liked what you heard today, can you go over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review? Not only would it help us launch the Decoding Superhuman podcast, but it would also help us spread the word about precision health all around the world. If you can go over to iTunes right now and leave a five-star review, it's really appreciated. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to hearing from you soon.